ancestry.com forward slash black history. All right, so today's topic is Juneteenth. Of course, this is the first year since we've had a recognized federal holiday that commemorates Juneteenth, which is June 19th, um, which we're gonna talk about in depth today. And most of the things that I'm gonna share with you, um, there are gonna be a few that you know, but most of the stuff that I'm going to share is gonna be things that are under the radar. Um, you know, things that most people don't consider when they're having a conversation about Juneteenth at large. It's a big story. While uh, most people that have known about it for extended periods of time usually are folks that live in Texas, because we have a federal holiday and companies are observing this holiday, we're now all being brought into the fold. And I've, I've even heard people ask the question, so well, how is this different than Black History Month? For me, Black History Month commemorates Black history across time, right? Um, people who are still living, people who um, have died, who have had major success and not, but just the whole history of Black people living in America is commemorated in February here in the United States, and it's in October in the UK. But Juneteenth differs. Juneteenth is a specific holiday that is set aside to honor and commemorate the lives of the people who lived to see the end of in their enslavement or those individuals who wanted to live to see the end of their enslavement and never got the opportunity to do so. That is a distinct difference between Black History Month and Juneteenth. There never has ever been another day that I've seen where we literally have a singular focus on our enslaved ancestors. And these could be people that you descend from, people that you connect to. They could be people from an ancestral community. It does not matter. We are really celebrating the individuals who, again, survived the, the system of enslavement here stateside and beyond. And um, again, um, that's the vantage point from which I operate um, from this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and start with a quote. Kevin Levine is an amazing historian. He's actually a high school teacher in New England. And he has a book actually that's out called Black Confederates. And it's all about the myth of Black Confederates. It's very, very, very good. And he's a really good follow on Twitter. Um, and one of the things he said one day that really stuck out to me was, he said, we constantly hear the refrain that Americans know nothing about their history, but what if the problem is more about what they have been taught and continue to be taught rather than being taught anything at all? So it's not that people aren't being taught something, it's what we're being taught, right? He, in essence, he's arguing that ignorance is easier to fix than being fed the wrong narratives from the beginning over and over and over again. It's why we get to the whole myth of Black Confederates to begin with. The fact that individuals will do a little bit of research and convince themselves, right, have confirmation bias that they have uncovered some mystery thing that nobody knows about. But when you dig deeper into the records, you find more. You discover, especially in the instance of Black Confederates, that they actually were not serving. In fact, when the Confederacy actually would allow Black men to enlist to fight, the war was over at that point. Most of the Black men that got pensions for Civil War service, it was because their slaveholders were in service and they were there servicing them. What do you mean, nigga, they were servicing them? They were doing laundry, running errands. It was like having a butler while you were at war. And that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what happened, okay? So with that, with that line of thinking, let's go into the backstory of Juneteenth, okay? Because again, the holiday has got a great punchy name, but we've got to understand what led up to us getting to Juneteenth or to June 19th, 1865, okay? And that whole conversation begins with the Civil War, okay? The Civil War begins at Fort Sumter in South Carolina on April 12th, 1861. That's where we have the beginnings of the Civil War, okay? And then two years later, right? A little less than two years later, we have Abraham Lincoln issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, those of you who are online and those of you who are in the room, do you have the thought that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves? You can raise your hand. Yeah. That's a weird thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird thought. <laughs> I had a reluctant hand in the front row. <laughs> That's okay. Mm -hmm. Most people, even I was taught right there in Moreno Valley, California. That's where I went to school. Okay, graduated from Valley View High School, right? Home of the Eagles. Went to school from second grade all the way until I graduated from high school. 
And I was consistently taught that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. And while it did free some enslaved people, there were nearly 800,000 who were not freed based on the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, what does that mean? That means, again, most of the general public is confused about which documents and laws actually freed the enslaved in the United States. Most are going to cite the Emancipation Proclamation, which is not entirely accurate. The proclamation applied to 10 states, being Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and Virginia. And these were states that were still in rebellion, right? Still seceding from the union, still saying, hey, we are not a part of the United States. We are creating our own country, which means that we're resigning our citizenship. Hear me, when you secede, you say you are no longer a citizen. That's like, you know, we, the term we use today, you gave up your citizenship, right? If people want to live in Brazil or otherwise, right, they, they renounce their citizenship or give up their citizenship in the United States and they become a legal citizen of that country. You have to think about the Civil War from that vantage point as well. The, in, the individuals who decided that they would secede and would align with the Confederacy were renouncing their United States citizenship. We never talk about it like that because that's not cute. That reminds us of the border wall and other things, right? Right? Or the term illegals that I grew up hearing. Um, and when you have the rebellion, right? Two years into the war, this is when this edict is, is issued. And there were exemptions that exempted certain areas and certain states, right? It did not cover nearly 500,000 enslaved people living in border states like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, which technically were still union states because they never signed on to be part of the Confederacy. Those enslaved were later freed by separate state and federal actions. And I'm not, that was not a misquote. Delaware was a slave state. <laughs> Told you you're gonna learn some things today. In fact, Delaware was one of the last states to ratify the 13th Amendment, which is what abolished slavery. Now you're like, Delaware, but it's in the, I know, we have slavery everywhere here. That's the story that most Americans are not comfortable with. We had slavery everywhere. It just ended sooner in the Northeast. And even in that instance, it was a gradual emancipation. It wasn't a drop, not a drop dead, you're free. No, they would say you had to get to the age of 21. Right. So if we keep going, Tennessee, where I'm sitting, had mostly returned to union control and was under a recognized union government, and it was itself exempted. Then Virginia had exemptions. The 48 counties that became West Virginia and seven additional counties and two cities that were under union control, they were exempted. Then Louisiana, New Orleans, and 13 parishes in Louisiana, which were mostly under federal control at the time of the proclamation, they were exempted. That added an additional 300,000 people who were not included. Then when you start talking about the Indian Territory, which we now know as Oklahoma, which had the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole Nations, who were slave holding Native American nations. They practiced chattel slavery. The Trail of Tears, there were at least 3,000 slaves on the Trail of Tears. How do I know this? Because my ancestors were among them. Because the Indian Territory, each of those nations that I just named, right? That we, you know, that historically we've called the five civilized tribes or the five tribes. They were their own nations that just so happened to be within the bounds of the United States. So they operated on different laws. The Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to their enslaved and also the 13th Amendment didn't apply to them either. Their enslaved were not freed until 1866, not until a year later was it solidified. Now you all are in Southern California and that is a huge location of freedmen of the five tribes or people who were descendants of the formerly enslaved of the five tribes. They are well just permeated down there in Southern California. 
huge population of people. In fact, when our chief goes around and does visits, he comes to LA because there's so many people there, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, exemptions also, again, they, they didn't cover more than 800,000 people in these places, okay? Now, compare that to the count that we got from the United States census on the slave schedules in 1860. The, the, the you know, specific census that counted enslaved people, there were 4 million enslaved people in the United States in 1860. So that means that nearly a quarter of those who were enslaved in the United States weren't freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. As in America, I know I'm an American citizen. We just don't do nuance well. We like black and white so much better. <laughs> so now that we've established the war begins April 1861 in South Carolina, um, and I will also call out that uh, there's a new museum that's being established, um, nearly finished in Charleston, South Carolina, that is the, at the site where nearly uh, at least 40% of the African enslaved people were brought into the United States, were brought in through Charleston. There is a museum going into that exact spot where that happened, that is going to be completed in January of 2023, and it's called the International African American Museum. You can actually go online, look at it. They even have a Center for Family History um, that uh, gives you a lot of information on how to research things. So we have April 60, 1861, beginning of the Civil War. We've got January of 1863 for the Emancipation Proclamation, which I will also add that along with the Confiscation Act signals the fact that Black men can enlist in the United States color troops. That is when the federal government says that Black men can be can fight for their freedom as a part of the U.S. Uh, military. You can't have the Confiscation Act and the Emancipation Proclamation. You can't have that, and you can't, well, you can't, you have to have those two things in order for you to have the U.S. color troops. If you think about the movie Glory, right? There were, what, a, nearly 180,000 Black men who enlisted in the Civil War to fight. And the statistics, I believe, are one in three or one in four uh, of your ancestors were mm -hmm. in the Civil War. That's high. All right, so then we get to January 1865. Finally, by the time four years has elapsed, we have the 13th Amendment, which is passes Congress, but it is not ratified until December 6th of that year. What does that mean? That means that Congress passes it, then each state has to go through their legislature and approve and ratify it. Of course, it was in folks' financial interest for them to wait until the end of the year. Why? We have crops to process. If we say that these individuals are free, they're going to leave and go and not do the work that I need them to do. So we didn't get enough states to ratify the amendment until December of 1865. Now, the 13th Amendment is what abolishes slavery within the United States. And it's, that's the thing that the specific language, language is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So we just said slavery is over except for if you were in jail, which is why our prison system, the numbers mirror that of the number of people who were enslaved prior to the 13th Amendment. Now here's another thing for free. This is, this is a great thing to tell people at, at get togethers and parties when we start having conversations about this topic. The state of Mississippi, which is just about 20 miles south of me, they didn't actually ratify the 13th Amendment until 2013. That's scary. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. No, I didn't misspeak. It took 148 years for them to ratify the 13th Amendment. The state of Mississippi passed black codes that governed what black people could and could not do in the state before they passed actually freeing them. And technically they brought it through the legislature in the nineties, but somebody forgot to deliver the paperwork. <laughs> so we get to 2013. All right, now the whole concept of freedom and Juneteenth, right? It's really a continuum. It's not just, oh, free and that's it. We celebrate on Juneteenth. No, because before we get to the 13th amendment, right? Before we get to the actual Juneteenth day, we have to also recognize that freedom was not something that people of African descent just allowed to happen to them. No, there we weren't passive about it. 
We didn't just wait on it to be given to us. We took it, right? You would not know who Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman were had they not chose to become fugitive slaves and free themselves. Now, the use of the term fugitive, right? For us, it makes us think of, I don't know, born identity or, you know, some of these movies that we watch. But the preferred term now is to call themselves, they self-emancipated. They said that this institution is not for me. I'm not going to live under it. So I'm going to free myself. If Black folks were passive about our freedom, why would we have to even establish a Fugitive Slave Act as a country that required that individuals who knew an enslaved person had absconded from their location, that they were legally required to return them? Why would we even have that if people took freedom on from a passive perspective, okay? The other thing is, 10% of the population of Black people living in America before the Civil War were free. They were not enslaved. What does that mean? That means that if you go and look on census records prior to 1870, federal census records, you find 1860, 1850, you are going to find Black people on those censuses as free people. In fact, since this is a group in California, for a little extra judge for you, go to the, uh, go to the Valley. Were the people up there panning gold? Up there in, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, way up north, right? Where, where we have the gold rush, okay? There were people who came from the deep south who brought their enslaved people to California to pan gold. And you will find the slaves listed on the census. And they knew that if they kept the enslaved in the state of California, because it's a free state, if they kept them there longer than a year, they legally had to free them. So what did they do? They would, day 360, they would take them out. Take them to Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, wherever you could go to reset the clock so that they could stay enslaved. So you will find enslaved people in California, even though it was a free state. The other thing you have to think about as well is there were some free people of color who were actually slaveholders. Usually, if that was the case, they owned their other family members. But that wasn't always the case because slavery was and continues to be a profitable economic enterprise. All right. Before the 13th Amendment, we also had contrabands. What are those? During the Civil War, as the US colored troops were formed, as the you know, Union troops are moving throughout the country, you start to see camps build up around them where the formerly enslaved decide they're gonna leave their plantations and they are going to follow the Union troops because they feel there is more safety there than them staying on a plantation. So they started to form what are called contraband camps. And those contraband camps, and you're looking at a picture of a man uh, who uh, was living near Raleigh, North Carolina, who was considered a contraband. His name was William Headley. Um, the contraband camps, they were administered or they were governed by the Freedmen's Bureau, which is the subject of the, of the documentary film that I'm a part of. Big collection that's out on Ancestry, 3.5 million records. So the Freedmen's Bureau was over the contraband camps. Of course, contraband, they are walking into their autonomy and choosing life for themselves. The other thing to go back to United States color troops, right? A condition of their enlistment, right? You decide you want to enlist or your slaveholder gives you permission to enlist. So then that way they can send a bill to the US government and be compensated for your value. Because that was a thing too. A condition of enlistment for the United States color troops and sailors in the US Navy who were black was them getting their freedom. So upon enlistment, they would get their freedom. And that means that 178,000, right? Nearly 180,000 black men. And we also have to remember the women who were cooks and maids for the troops, right? There was a lot of them. You have to remember 25% of the US Navy was black. And during the Civil War, the US Navy was integrated. It resegregated itself afterwards and then reintegrated. Might want to tell uh, Langston that. 
Okay. <laughs> right, because her son's in the Navy. <laughs> so, right. So a lot of people don't recognize that. But again, we've got to give light to our veterans of U.S. color troops in the Navy, again, during the Civil War, because a condition of their enlistment was them getting their freedom. So let's talk about a battle, since we're talking about the Civil War, right? That's the whole centerpiece around all of this. And let's talk about the Battle of Palmetto Ranch. Now, things were nearly done with the Civil War, okay? But of course, Texas had to come out being Texas. One thing we know about Texas is Texas is going to Texas and Florida is going to Florida. And you know exactly you know exactly what I mean by those statements. Um, by the time we get to May 13th, 1865, we are a month after the surrender of General Robert E. Lee, okay? Appomattox Courthouse has happened, okay? President Lincoln is dead. But that didn't mean the war was over, right? Even though there was a surrender, the people in Texas, they were trying to hold out. And on May 13th, 1865, we have the Battle of Palmetto Ranch. Why am I telling you about this? Because it's the last land action of the Civil War. And if we don't have this battle, we don't get to Juneteenth. It's happening right there in the same state. So what happens, okay? This battle happens in, at Palmetto Ranch near Brownsville, Texas, current day, okay? And a big part of the reason why this battle happened and the Union was successful was because of a Black regiment that was a part, several Black regiments that were a part of the battle. There were 250 men from the 62nd U.S. Colored Infantry who fought for the Union victory. Now, the 62nd Infantry, one of the things you got to know about Civil War service, especially for the U.S. color troops, is a lot of these units were created under the states. And then once Lincoln, you know, signed through the Emancipation Proclamation and we have the Confiscation Act and all of that, that signaled that those state organized troops could be then mustered into federal service. So a lot of U.S. color troops regiments have two different names and two different regiments, right? Could even have different numbers, okay? So the 62nd was originally organized as the Missouri Volunteers in December of 1863. So we get Emancipation Proclamation in January. By later on that year, Missouri had organized a volunteer regiment of Black men, and then they were mustered into federal service later as the U.S. Color Troops 62nd Infantry. Now, again, Without the fall of Texas in May of 1865, right, care of this regiment and several others, we do not get Juneteenth, okay? Now, when we start talking about Juneteenth, we have to talk about General Gordon Granger. You're looking at a nice picture of him, all that contrast. Love the, love the Library of Congress. They have a great picture. If you've never just browsed it, just go browse the Library of Congress pictures. There's so much on there. But this is a picture of General Gordon Granger and he's the individual who delivered the news of freedom in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865. Okay, which is why we have Juneteenth. It's like a, you know, a shortened version of June 19th. Okay. Here's the thing about Granger. Many people don't know that Granger was only given command of the Department of Texas on June 10th of 1865. So he was only over this for nine days by the time he had to go out and give this edict, okay? And he was given the command by General Philip Sheridan, um, commander of the military division of the Southwest. And of course, upon his arrival on June 19th, he declared that the institution of slavery was officially over. Now, of course, the celebration that ensued afterwards and all of that we're celebrating and now is a national uh, holiday, federal holiday, is Juneteenth. But many people have never read the order that he read. So let's go ahead and read it. Now, as you're using your sanctified imagination to imagine him reading this order, because we just saw him, don't think of a traditional plantation. Galveston is a Gulf community. You saw all that water during the trailer that I showed you? That was in Texas. Think of Mobile. Think of New Orleans. Think of the Gulf Coast when you think of Galveston. So here's the order. This is uh, as printed in the Galveston Daily News on June 21st, 1865. It says the people are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, okay, proclamation being the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Two years earlier, it was issued, okay? Texas, again, was under the proclamation was non-exempted because it was still insurrectionary. 
So all he's doing is coming in and reaffirming, Lincoln told y'all, you didn't listen. So here I am and I'm gonna tell you again, okay? All slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that of employer and hired labor. Think about that. You're supposed to go from being a slave owner and they're enslaved to employer and hired labor. Then it says the freedmen, meaning the newly emancipated, they are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages. So you just told the slaveholders they have to pay the people they haven't been paying. And you just told the enslaved that they need to stay where they were living, which is at their plantation with their slaveholder. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military post contrabands, right? I'm laying all this out for you guys before we get to this, this, or this order. So they tell them they can't collect the military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness there or elsewhere. This is where we get the seeds of vagrancy laws. You know, the whole reason why my father used to tell me to carry around a $2 bill in my pocket so that nobody could ever claim that I was loitering. Mm -hmm. I was not raised in the South and neither was my father. Yet, the thought process around loitering and vagrancy carried down to me. So let's go a couple weeks later. By the time we get to 4th of July, the Galveston Daily News is posting another circular. Consider this a flyer, something they're trying to get the word out about, okay? And it notes the terms of emancipation. So here we are, by the time we get to the Independence Day for the United States, the language gets even more interesting. All persons, formerly slaves, are earnestly enjoined to remain with their former masters under such contracts as may be made for the present time. They told them to stay where they were. This whole idea we have, if you've ever seen a movie called The Wiz that was put on by Barry Gordy, it flopped, but it became a cult classic. There is a part of the movie at the end when they, it's basically it's the takeoff of The Wizard of Oz. When Eveline gets killed, and in that version, she ends up getting flushed down a huge toilet. But, you know, that's not the point. <laughs> at the end, the people, <laughs> they have these costumes on, and they're like leather, and they're zipping them down, and they're coming out, and it's like Alvin Ailey explodes in a factory. Like, literally like that. We had this whole idea that Juneteenth was like that part in the movie. I don't know if that's the case. If you told me that I needed to stay where I was at, I'd have had, I had no autonomy. Like, I couldn't leave. You told me to stay there. You, you're telling me that I have to get under a contract and that my interest, as well as the interest of, your, of my former slave owner and other parties requiring my services, it, it renders a course necessary of vital importance until permanent arrangements are made under the auspices of the Freedmen's Bureau. That means that I'm supposed to enter into a labor contract with my former slaveholder that establishes the terms of my work for him or her. What I'm going to be paid, what I'm going to be received, things like shoes, clothing, any of that, or maybe not any of that stuff. The contract setup up will be administered by the Freedmen's Bureau, okay? No, it must be borne in mind in connection that cruel treatment or improper use of authority given to employers will not be permitted. Well, as both parties to the contract may will be equally bound to its fulfillment on their part. That's them saying the Freedmen's Bureau is here to make sure that nobody's going to get over on you and that you cannot beat and kill these people without, without consequences. But then in the next paragraph, you guys know it's not going to go that easy. Come on, when do we ever do anything that easy in America? Never. Not even now. No persons formerly slaves will be permitted to travel on the public thoroughfares without passes or permits from their employers or to congregate in buildings or in camps at, at, at or adjacent to any military post. So this is literally just like enslavement, where I had to have a pass in order for me to move to a different plantation or go somewhere else. It goes on that they will not be subsisted in idleness in any way except as employees of the government or in cases of extreme destitution or sickness. And in such cases, the officers authorized to order these issues shall be the judges as to the justice of the claim for each for such subsistence. Idleness, again, they keep talking about idleness. You better get to work. You better work for us. How is this any different than enslavement? 
Not sure. Not sure. Okay. Now, Galveston has been largely erased from the story of Juneteenth. Um, and that's something that I personally have been trying to be more mindful of. And the reason why I think that happened is because of some really incredible people in Houston. We have to give them their flowers as well. Um, Amer African American populations across Texas collected money to buy property dedicated to Juneteenth celebrations because they were celebrating this every year. In Houston, the effort was led by Reverend Jack Yates, who was a Baptist minister and was formerly enslaved himself. His church, Antioch Baptist, along with Trinity Methodist Episcopal Church, they formed the Colored People's Festival and Emancipation Park Association. 150 years ago this year, in 1872, they pulled $1,000 together to put down on 10 acres of open land as the home of their Juneteenth celebration. In honor of their freedom, they named the park Emancipation Park. There is a huge concert and events taking place there this weekend because it's the 150th anniversary of them purchasing the land. Now it's not gonna be aired nationally, but one of the local affiliates um, in Houston is gonna be uh, is going to be airing it. And it's, you know, I'm talking, you know, major performers like Frankie Beverly and Mays and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, before we get to the federal holiday, Juneteenth largely was celebrated in Texas, but it is now a national holiday. The other thing you have to remember is that in other locations across the country, they celebrated Juneteenth on different days or the idea of Juneteenth or Emancipation Day. In some spots, it was celebrated in August. Other places, it was uh, uh, later on in the year. It varied. But now we're all coming together around this specific date to honor our enslaved ancestors. Now, there are freedom celebrations in the, in the diaspora, right, in terms of African countries. We hear about National Day and other days, right? Um, and a lot of these days are tied to the dates of decolonization by European countries when, you know, the UK, Germany, um, when they leave countries in Africa and allow them to be independent nations. One of the most recent examples we've seen of this is um, the Trinidad, or no, it's Barbados. It's Barbados, who declared their independence from, uh, from the United Kingdom. So of course, when we have conversations about this, we've got to talk about Haiti and them declaring their independence in 1804, okay? And then you notice the other nations, most of their uh, Freedom Day celebrations or their Freedom Day commemorations revolve around, or they happen after, well after 1804, we're talking the 1960s. So when you're having a conversation around the civil rights movement here stateside and what the world was doing in terms of what they were watching, you have to also think about the fact that this may have galvanated individuals living on the continent of Africa to seek their freedom as well. All right, so for this last section, we're gonna talk about what freedom looked like, okay? And we're gonna talk about it from the vantage point of an individual who not only was enslaved, but also helped to ensure that Juneteenth would become the holiday and commemoration that it is. And the individual we're gonna talk about is a man named Commodore Givens. He was born about 1838 in Cooper County, Missouri, which is halfway between Kansas City and St. Louis. And what you're looking at right now is his Civil, his Civil War service card for his service in the 62nd Regiment of the United States Colored Troops. Of course, we just talked about them and their involvement uh, in the Battle of Palmetto Ranch, the last land battle, the Civil War that took place in Texas. We would not have Juneteenth without that. Commodore mustered in to service in the Civil War in Boonville, Missouri on November 29th, 1863, okay? And again, remember January that year is Emancipation Proclamation. Remember Missouri was exempted because they never, they never aligned with the Confederacy. So technically, Commodore was not freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Note, we have uh, under remarks, it says that he was claimed by Alex Givens of Cooper County, Missouri. Now, that means that Alex Givens was his slaveholder. And you're like, how was he claimed? Well, you have to think about it. Go back to what I mentioned about slaveholders giving their enslaved the ability to go and enlist. And as a result of allowing them to do that, 
they could then petition the U.S. government to be reimbursed for the value of that enslaved person. And you all are in California now, you have a task force that just drafted 600 pages of recommendations around reparations. <laughs> so this is a similar program, just earlier, right? You'll note at the bottom of the remarks, it says skirmish on the Rio Grande near Palmito Ranch, Texas on the 12th and 13th of May, 1865. So we are learning about all of his civil war service. Has anybody else seen these? If you have not, you could spend hours in these muster cards and they're available for, for regiments. And this is just the first, this is just the first card. The ones that follow are, you know, two months. They tell you how much the person got paid, whether or not they lost things like a canteen or a haversack and they got charged for it. You'll mm -hmm. even see when people died, you will find the claim paperwork from uh, slaveholders that will list who the slaveholder purchased this enslaved person from. All kinds of stuff lives in these files. They're available on Ancestry and they're on Family Search. Now, let's talk about Missouri for a second because in an effort to balance power in Congress between slave and free states, Missouri was admitted in 1820 as a slave state. Missouri somehow has managed to eclipse its, its image as being a slave state, right? Everybody said St. Louis, oh, there weren't slaves here. Actually, no, St. Louis, it was a part of Louisiana Purchase was a part of Louisiana, right? So that whole culture permeates in St. Louis, okay? Maine at the same time as Mrs. Uh, Missouri's uh, admittance was admitted as a free state. In 1854, Missouri, the Missouri Compromise was repealed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Three years later, the Missouri Compromise was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision. Remember that said that property can't sue us because they didn't consider him to be a citizen, okay? Um, and it also ruled that Congress did not have the authority to prohibit slavery in the territories. So again, Missouri's exempted, right? It's because it didn't, it didn't secede. So then that means that Commodore is taking a risk by enlisting, right? If we take the information about Alexander Givens. What we learn is that Alexander Givens actually died in December of 1862. So that claimed by Alexander Givens. At that point, at the point of Commodore's enlistment, his slaveholder was dead, which means that when the claim was filed, it was filed by his estate, his slaveholder's estate. You are looking at part of the estate inventory of Alexander Givens. At the top, it says appraisement of slaves and other estate of Alexander Givens deceased. And you see things like a brown horse and three head of cows and all of that, and you get down to the bottom in the first line that says one Negro boy named Commodore 28 years with a value of $400. Now, again, Commodore enlisting, it was risky because he was the enslaved person with the highest value on this inventory, which means that he was extremely valuable. The other thing is, he literally got up and walked off right in the middle of the war and in the middle of the estate proceeding to do this. So it may be that he he rendered the uh, the executor kind of moot, right? Like he's gone, might as well claim his value, right? Totally could have happened. So let's examine the risk. Commodore enlisted about 10 miles from where he lived. Okay, and at that point in the state of Missouri, any citizen could have apprehended him and been compensated between five and ten dollars, mm -hmm. which if you adjust that for inflation is between one hundred and two hundred dollars today. Now, slaves or I'm sorry, and sheriffs were required to advertise about the confinement of enslaved people for three months. So if somebody caught you and they have you in jail, they could advertise that they had caught you for three months. Right. And then. If they got no reply, that meant that they could sell you a public auction. Mm -hmm. And part of the proceeds would pay for the cost that they spent to board you in the jail. And some of that money helped fund the state's university. Now, based on the laws of Missouri, a black person was one who had one fourth part or more of Negro blood. That means that if you had three white grandparents 
and only one of your grandparents was black, you were black in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Slave laws apply to both the enslaved and free people of color. A lot of times I will encounter individuals who uh, are very proud of the fact that their ancestors were free, but they fail to realize that in just about every state, the black codes and slave codes apply to free people of color, just like they apply to the enslaved. Free people of color were not legally citizens of the United States until the 14th amendment, just like the descendants of the formerly enslaved. Which means that if you had a beef for something that was not handled locally, good luck, the federal government was not protecting you because you were not a citizen. The Naturalization Act only applied to white people. Now, going forward in Missouri, they had slave patrols, right? Which of course were a, they were a precursor to our modern police system and they were mandated by the state of Missouri in 1845, okay? They worked at least 12 hours a month or as many hours as the court appointing it desired. Members received 25 cents per hour. The patrols were not, however, supposed to prevent slaves from attending, you know, uh, Sunday worship services. Primarily slave patrols attempted to exert control over the slave community by using fear and force. And historians agree that the patrols were probably used sporadically and only at times when white citizens feared, feared rebellion or insurrection. And the people that were part of these patrols, they could give people between 10 and 20 lashes. And they're not even their slaveholders. So again, Commodore and really pretty much anybody that was in his unit as well as the US color troops, they faced a number of risks and, and situations in order for them to enlist. Now here's the bright side of this entire story. This is the front page of the Lincoln Clarion, which is the student paper in Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, okay? And it chronicles the lasting effect of the 66th or 62nd US color troops, which was Commodore's unit. While they were enlisted and in service, these men who largely were formerly enslaved, along with their officers, started to hold basically school. They started to educate individuals who were not able to read and write. And they had a, a culture that they created uh, that became so well-functioning that they feared what would happen after they got back home after the war was over. And so as a result of the casual conversation that took place between Lieutenants Aaron Aber uh, Adamson and Richard B. Foster, while they were awaiting discharge at Fort McIntosh, Texas, it's recorded as the spark which grew into an alluded fact Foster was disturbed uh, that the meager education provided the enlisted men in the 62nd Colored Infantry would have to end as the group mustered out of service and returned to their homes in Missouri. Addison remarked, if our regiment will give money enough to start a school in Missouri, will you take charge of it? This chance conversation led to donations of $1,034 from the officers of the 62nd and 3,966 from the enlisted men. Do you all know what that means? That means that the men that were not officers who probably for the first time in their lives were receiving money, either through bounty payments like a sign-on bonus or just their every month payments from the federal government as a result of their service, they gave their money up to start a school. What they received was generations changing. Now, to that money that was added by the 62nd, an additional 1,379 was given by officers and men of the 65th U.S. Colored Troops. And with approximately $6,000, Richard Baxter Foster finally found his way to Jefferson City and established Lincoln Institute, which is still in operation today. It is Lincoln University. Mm -hmm. And it was started by this regiment. So what happens to Commodore? Well, one thing is that it appears that he became literate. On the 1870 US Census, which is at the top, you see him there with his wife, Elizabeth. You see him there with a daughter, Mary, son, Henry, son uh, or daughter, Patsy, and a, a son named John. And he's got two tick marks in the one in the cannot read and the other one in a cannot write. But then when we get down to the 1880 Census, 
where he has a much younger wife. We're going to, uh, you know, we're hitting May, December by the time we get to 1880. Mm -hmm. We still have his children, Patsy, looks like, and John is there. We've got other kids, right? And those tick marks in the cannot read and cannot write column were not there anymore. So I definitely think his unit and that experience that he had was definitely something that added to his life. So of course we wanna honor and remember Commodore Gibbons. He eventually died on May 12, 1894 um, in Missouri and he was able to collect a pension from the US Color Troops, his service. And of course, again, you have to remember that we would not have Juneteenth if it was not for individuals like him. Mm -hmm. All right, questions, queries, conundrums. Any questions for Nika? Everybody learned something they didn't know because I sure did. <laughs> I'd just like to say that the talk was very enlightening. And I thought I knew something about it. Me too. <laughs> but it was very helpful and very informative. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, Miss Shannon. I see your hand up. Hey, Nika, how are you? It's I'm good. good. To see you again. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on some of my family who are in Illinois and Missouri and St. Louis area. And you just taught me a whole bunch. I realized that Missouri was a slave state, but that's a whole part of the history that I had not brought into what I was working on. So basically, I just wanted to comment and say thank you. Once again, you've opened some doors for me. So I'll start looking at that, um, the concept of the people that were there and how that affected people in St. Louis is very important to my story, so. Right, and, and that's the thing, I mean, granted, we didn't have large expansive enslavement like we had, you know, like in neighboring Arkansas or even Tennessee, but it was still there. Um, and then when you talk about the Freedmen's Bureau, people tend to overlook Missouri because they're like, oh, there weren't that many field offices there but most of the records were kept at the state level, which means that they were kept in St. Louis. So when you start doing searches uh, for the Freedmen's Bureau in Missouri, I would just use name and Missouri. Don't drill down to the well in your grandmother's front yard um, okay. because the records for the state at large could, um, most, of the, most of the time I've seen in Missouri, they've been kept at the state, they were kept at the St. Louis uh, state office, state level office. Okay, I will do that, thank you. No problem. Uh Nika, when you mentioned about um, families having picnics and get togethers um, in June and August, I remember in Riverside, August was the old timers picnic and people would reference Juneteenth. And so I'm, I'm thinking back as a kid and this was at Fairmont Park and there were a lot of families who were from Texas and Riverside. And so I, I'm thinking that must have been our, that had to have been our Juneteenth celebration. Right. I'll have right. to ask my mom, and I have a lot of documents about those picnics with pictures. So I'm going to have to go through the garage and go through the bins and, and ask my mom, is that what that was? Because it probably was. So thank you. That is something I learned today. Right, right. Again, they, we had them in the Indian Territory. Um, in fact, there was a project that I was researching um, on a particular regiment of the United States Color Troops. And I was seeing veterans of that unit speaking at Emancipation Day. And I was like, wait a minute, because again, we're, we, so many of us living, we really honestly think that Juneteenth is just about Texas and that Texas was the only place that celebrated this. And that is nowhere near the case at all. Again, you just, you, in your lifetime, Tracy, we were still doing it, you know, then. You just, it was called Old Timers Day. That's what, that's what it was. <laughs> it was really, but old that was literally picnic. what it was. Right, that's literally what it was. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question in the chat. Just curious why different people celebrated Juneteenth on different days before it became a federal holiday. Is it because of different states getting free at different times? Uh, any suggestions on how to best celebrate and commemorate Juneteenth tomorrow? Yeah, I'm still trying to find a rhyme or reason. Um, I kind of feel like it's like with Black Church's Homecoming Sunday. You know, it's kind yeah. of the same thing where it's like not everybody celebrates it on the same day. So, um, and, and, and again, because every state ratified the 13th Amendment at different times. So 
Um, you know, so it could be associated with that. It could be associated with a major civil war battle. It could be because it's close to someone's birthday. I mean, that's the whole reason Black History Month is because of Negro History Week and the number of Black luminaries whose birthdays were in February. It's not because we wanted to be near Valentine's Day. <laughs> I, mean, I love it, right? I love it because it's the month before my birthday. So I get to do a whole bunch of great, you know, Black history stuff like before that. But um, yeah, so in terms of commemorating, I think, you know, again, my, my focus has really just been on honoring the lives of my ancestors that were enslaved. Um, and some of those people I don't have names for. Um, some of those people I do have names for. Some of those folks I uh, don't have pictures of. Some of those people I do have pictures of. And so it's just sharing their stories. You know, um, one of my memories came up on Facebook about uh, literally the, the one grandparent that my grandmother has, this Tracy's cousin has, that I haven't been able to get back a generation for. And, and my grandmother's grandparents were enslaved. That's how close this is for me. Mm -hmm. uh, my great great grandparents were enslaved. And so um, thankfully due to records access and to DNA, I've been able to trace back on lines where we didn't have any information for my grandmother's grandparents. But there's one that I have not been able to trace. It, but even though I don't know her enslavement story, the one remnant that I have of it is the fact that when she got older, she would be extremely emotional. And uh, family members didn't quite understand it until one day she talked about the day that she was sold away from her family. And she carried this her entire life. And we have, we don't know her parents' names, nothing. And when I'm talking about that, I'm saying, you pull her death certificate, her son is the informant, and he does not know his grandparents' names mm -hmm. at all. So you have to think, was, was she a child? I mean, all these things run through your head. And so for me, the way that I commemorate Juneteenth is, let me see if I can find Grandma Alice's people, because that's who she wanted to be. She wanted to, want, you know, she longed for her family. And thinking about, again, some of the stories that, that we have, that we don't have, and that are emerging. Um, and there's a lot of really good stuff coming on TV tomorrow. There's going to be this all-star cast concert coming on CNN um, at 4 p.m. you all's time at 7 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be airing um, with a lot of various artists. There's a lot of... Uh, TV shows and things that are running. But yeah, you know, even if you don't necessarily have enslaved ancestors, um, you know, take a peek into the Freedmen's Bureau. Just search a name or maybe put in a location and just see what records you can find. And I can guarantee you're going to be in there for a while when you do it. That was my question. What's the first step you would recommend if you want to do a genealogical search of your family background? So uh, the first thing that we should do is we should recognize the asset that we are in the story. There are things that you remember, there are people that you remember that you you are the expert on it, right? So you wanna take down what you know. You also want to talk to friends and or family um, around what they remember and who they know. And you also wanna start gathering documents that are in your possession. Funeral programs, birth, marriage, and death certificates, books, photos, any of that kind of stuff. Notice I did not say go online and start searching first. The reason why I say that is because the online search is supposed to supplement what you don't know in terms of information that you already have, whether it's stored here or whether you have a paper document that, that you know, um, that tells you that stuff. So get all your, your people and documents together first. Then when you go online to search, that is to fill in the dots on stuff you don't know. So um, start with yourself, involve with your family, gather all your documents, then begin creating a tree. You're at a library, they have Ancestry available to you there through the institutional version of it. Um, you can form, a, you can create a family tree, accounts are free on Ancestry, trees are free. The um, cost comes in or the subscription is involved with accessing the some of the records. And now there are a bunch of records that are free on Ancestry. Uh, but not everything is. And so you, you'd be searching through records like the census, uh, through birth, marriage, and death, military records, yearbooks. Um, eventually, you'll probably move to newspapers, um, all kinds of stuff that, that's available on um, 
is available online. Um, what state are you researching in? Um, I'm from New York, but my mother's people are from South Carolina. Okay, so South Carolina has great records online. You're gonna have uh, death certificates that you can get. You're gonna have marriage licenses along with census records and all that. The only thing you have to potentially be concerned about is if you, and this is for everybody, if there was a courthouse fire during the Civil War or thereafter, that could destroy records. But South Carolina, y'all, I, I, I make fun of my genealogy buddies that research in South Carolina <laughs> because I tell them that they ain't really living until they come to the deep South and, and come down and get hazed in Mississippi and Louisiana. Because <laughs> you guys have it so much easier. Virginia and the Carolinas, oh, whatever. They, they, be, they are scared to come down, Tracy. They literally are, they're like, oh, I don't know if I can research that. I'm like, we don't have a choice. You know, you look at the downward migration of enslaved people, right? Slavery starts in the upper South and then, you know, as slavery expands, it moves down into the deep South. And those of us who have deep South roots, we can't say we're not gonna research Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina. We don't have a choice because everybody is coming from those places. But it's funny when the people who stay there and are researching there, they don't want to come the other way. Mm -hmm. It's like they, and they have to largely because of DNA testing where they're finding cousins that are in the deep South, but their families never left. Of course, that is going to indicate that they were probably separated by enslavement. Mm -hmm. And just to add to what Nika mentioned, um, our library is fortunate that we have access to newspapers.com, Heritage Quest, the library edition of Ancestry and uh, Fold 3, which are military records. And all you need is your library card to access those. So if you don't have a library card, an Upland library card, um, that would be a way for you to access those resources. And those are free. Mm -hmm. Ancestry, you have to use here in the library. Mm -hmm. The other resources, you can access those from home. And so we're really fortunate because those resources are like gold. Um, and so that's why we want to make sure people in our community are aware that those are free resources that you don't have to pay to use those um, and that we're willing to show you how to use those resources. We've had people call and say, can I come and somebody help me? Um, that's why we're starting this group. And also if somebody needs some one-on-one -on -one help, um, Chester and Lynn, well, Lynn, they I know you've done a lot of research as well. So we've got people who know how to use these resources. Um, again, um, I was just happy that we were able to uh, subscribe to those. Um, and then for Nika to, you know, just elaborate a little bit more um, on resources that are available um, in the states that your families resided in. So, you have to have a, be a resident of Upland in order to get it. You do not. <laughs> you can get it today. Yes, you can get it today and, um, you know, start searching or, you know, like Mika uh, said, you know, look at, I have tons of uh, funeral programs that my mom kept. I'm like, what? What am I supposed to do with this stuff? But it is really interesting. Um, Mika and I have this ongoing joke when when somebody passes away and we talk about, how the obituary is written. Um, raised in the church, was uh, joined and was baptized and attended the local right, school. Confess, confess, confess the hope in Christ at an early yeah. age. <laughs> um, but there's there's and there's a lot of information in in funeral programs, family Bibles. Um, if you have a family Bible, sometimes you'll find something tucked in the Bible that you weren't looking for. Um, it, just in being a librarian, I've been able to help some people reconnect to family members. Somebody donated, you'll appreciate this, a family Bible to the friends of the library. Mm -hmm. And and the friends were gonna throw it away. And I said, oh, no, no, Ooh, no, 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 no. Don't throw the Bible away. And so they're like, well, here, here you go. And it was falling apart. And as I was looking at it, this family was, um, they were from the Midwest, very well documented. So somebody really spent a lot of time to put this info in this Bible. And, I mean, I just couldn't let it go. I had to reconnect this Bible to this family. And so what I called the library in the town where these people live. And the librarian said, oh, yeah, we know that family. They come in here all the time. And they let them know that I had this Bible. And um, I was able to Skype with this family member. And she said, I have never seen this Bible. I don't know how it got to California. Wow. Um, and 
you know, she, and she was a retired librarian. So that just made my day. <laughs> and I was able to send it, you know, back to being in possession of that family. And I mean, that doesn't happen very often, but sometimes just as a librarian, just getting somebody started, they get excited and you just can't let it go. And you're up at three o'clock in the morning, looking at ancestry. Um, at least that's what my husband's like, what are you doing? I said, I can't let it go. Um, I mean, I have a family connection I'm still trying to find. And, and Nika is like, well, try this or try that. I am going to find that grandparent, um, paternal grandfather. So um, any other questions? No, but I think you should. Thank you, Nika. <laughs> So she's been super busy, as she mentioned this week. She forgot to mention that uh, the trailer for the documentary was up in Times Square. Um, I was just like, what? <laughs> um, I have learned a lot from Nika and we just kind of met by chance um, from a, another family member. And so I, I've really learned a lot and um, I was adopted as a baby. So finding this Paternal family has been amazing for me and getting to know my family members and just my family history um, has really just, you know, made me have an identity and know who my people are and uh, where my grandparents came from down in Louisiana by way of Mississippi. Um, so um, thank you again, Nika. Thank you everyone who joined us online. Um, this was great and I hope you all had a great time. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank Thanks, Nika. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye.